The ocean is much deeper than we thought. Part 3 Most of my old crew, after leaving the navy, struggled to get over their longing for the ocean. Such was the case for my submarine captain, Louis Jason. He always claimed that the sea would be his final resting place, where he truly belonged, and following his honorable discharge, he went straight into hyperbaric pipeline welding. It's a dangerous job, where the only enemy is invisible, always stalking each new mission, a foe that can't be sensed, but with an ability to destroy everything you are in a split second. Pressure. Maybe I'm cursed. Unable to live on land with my own people, but at least I'll die where I belong, he had said. Jason would be lucky enough to forever be united with his one true love at the sight of a burst pipe that took him away, finally making him one with the deep blue. It's funny how the brain operates as everything around you is falling to pieces, far beyond your own control. Once there is nothing left you can do, the mind turns into a place of safety, fond memories from a time long since past. For me, those memories belong to my time of service, to my old captain and crew. It wasn't an easy time. But it was filled with purpose, with my problems suddenly confined to the ocean. When Robert yelled at me to get my ass in gear, I finally snapped back into reality. Doc, come on, we need to get the hell out of here! He shouted. James returned to his central dome alongside Abby. They had heard the alarms but hadn't the faintest idea about what had occurred to the brief absence. Get to Section A. There are always still two transport capsules. Get number 05 ready for departure and wait for me, Robert said. Cap, what are we going to do? James asked. Jennifer is in lockdown. I'm going to get her. What if the creatures got inside? Abby asked. Robert thought for a moment before handing her the walkie. If you don't hear from me within 15, just leave, he ordered. The station shook as another hole was torn through one of the sections. My ears popped from the shockwave. I'm coming with you, James said. You're not facing them alone. No, we need you to pilot a transport capsule. If you get hurt, we're stuck down here. It wasn't an invalid excuse. They all knew fully well that the submarine was easy enough for any of the crew members to maneuver. But Roberts refused to risk any more lives and would use whatever reason he could come up with. Cap, please, that's an order. Get out of here now. He hesitantly agreed and started leaving. I'll join you then. I know nothing about the situation or the sub, but I can at least assist you should something happen. I sat, knowing he could come up with an excuse to stop me. He reluctantly agreed, and together we headed for the labs in section C, worrying that Jennifer might be trapped behind the airlock. Or worse. Drowning is a horrible way to die. Once you realize that there is no way to reach the surface, that you are trapped in a cold dark tomb, your throat simply closes up. No matter how hard you try to inhale, your body simply refuses, even as the agonizing pain of running out of air overpowers your natural instinct to breathe. You simply refuse to give in to the overwhelming desire. It isn't until your body starts shutting down and the corners of your vision start to darken. That's you reach the breaking point 
and your brain decides to pull something in, regardless of whether air is present or not. Suddenly ice cold water floats in through your throat, unstoppingly filling your lungs, so desperate for air. It's a clumsy, painful way to go. And by the time water has filled each alavoy, most are still conscious with just enough time to regret the decision ever entering the ocean. I thought that it was funny as we run through the airlock that at least we wouldn't drown. Surely the worms would consume us, all the pressure from the collapsing station would instantly crush us. How did the hull get breached anyway? I asked as we got closer. It's supposed to be impossible, but I'm sure it's those fucking monsters, Robin said. The alarm had stopped, alerting us about the hull breach, and was now recommending a station-wide evacuation. Warning! Hull, integrating, severely compressing all crew reports to designate docking stations, it said. How much time do we have? Not enough. As we turned to the corner at section C, we saw Jennifer sitting against the wall at the wrong side of the airlock. It took a moment to realize the horrors of her situation. We saw her legs fused with a flash of the syncytium. They had started eating away her lower body, digging away through her flesh and rapidly replacing her organs with their own meat. Despite all of this, she remained conscious. Jen! Robert said, the only words he could muster from the shock of what lay in front of our eyes. She slowly turned her head towards us, with her eyes red from crying, as worms had consumed her insides. Captain, is that you? She said, weakly, blind from blood filling the inside of her eyes. I'm here, Jen. I guess the sample wasn't dead after all. <laughs> she joked with a hoarse voice as she coughed up what could only be a mixture of blood and lungs. Maybe tell the doc to double check these things in the future. He's here with me now, Robert explained. I'm so sorry, Jen, but I know there's nothing left to do. I guess this is just it. She coughed up, finally spewing out pieces of her lung and worms. Don't worry, Captain. It's not your fault that a monster from the abyss crawled its way in up to destroy us, she said. She said, voice cracking as she writhed in agony. I looked over at Robert. He looked horrified, but couldn't take his eyes off her. It really hurts. Please inject the section, she cried. I just want it to be over. Robert nodded, forgetting that she couldn't see him. I went over to the control panel. It was fairly easy to use, especially after having witnessed Henry mess with it before. All I needed was a passcode. I thought it wouldn't be right to let Robert essentially execute her himself. I'll do it, I assured him. Rob? Jennifer said. Yes? Don't let these fuckers get out of the surface. Promise me that much. I promise. Her abandon sounded bulging out. She screamed in pain as the worms started tearing open her stomach. Captain, the code, I asked. He told me the numbers and I input them without hesitating. Years of watching people suffer, a prolonged death, knowing that we could do nothing but pointlessly extend their lives, had me pulling the plug. Immediately hatches opened up on the walls, an alarm sounded as water started pouring in. But since the hull had already been partially breached, 
they quickly collapsed on in themselves. Within a few seconds, Jennifer had died. Let us get out of here, Robert said. We ran back towards the central area. We had to transfer the entire station to get towards the section A. It was only a remaining escape, but as we got to the office, we could hear something moving within the walls, knocking their way through the pipes. The pumps! Robert yelled. They're getting in through the fucking pumps! Talos pumps were ancient machinery compared to the rest of the station. As the dome was inserted, they needed to move tons of water outside and immerse pressure. But after finishing the station, they had been long since forgotten. Left inside the walls while they installed the more permanent solutions. Before we could react, the walls broke open and Sinxion poured itself through the holes, taking the shape of a malformed flesh, exiting rapidly alongside the walls. They were cut off from our escape, with only the office available as temporarily refuge from the oncoming swarm of worms and flow of flesh. But our safe haven would quickly become nothing more than another prison of extending our survival. It won't hold him for long, Robert said. What now? Robert went straight for his desk, pulling the pistol off the top drawer. You brought a gun to the bottom of the ocean? I asked. You didn't? He shot back. Never know when you might have to quell a mutiny, he laughed nervously. He could tell I was amused, but both knew a gun wouldn't slow them down significantly. But any help was welcome. He continued to rummage through the closet in the room, eventually pulling out two unused hazmat suits, just like the one I had used while inspecting Mike. It kept you safe inside the airlock. The worms couldn't penetrate the suit, right? Robert asked with a pleading eyes. Look, they breached the EPM suit, made of fucking metal. I don't think these will make a big difference. Might slow them down, but that's it, I said. It's our best shot. The worms had started to pile up on the door, forming a constructing mesh, slightly cracking the glass. It's now or never. James better have the damn sup ready to go, Robert said as we got in the suits. He fired a shot, but not at the door, but at the tempted glass wall beside it, shattering it to a million cubical pieces as we jumped through. I stumbled to the ground, a few worms getting onto my hand as I stood up. Robert pulls them off me and shoved me forward. We spurred it to the entrance of Section E. We were far faster than the worms, but they were forming a flash covering most of the ceiling and dropped down on top of us for each step we took. Another hole in the wall bursted open directly above the airlock towards Section A, causing another slump of meat to land on the front of the door. Shit! Robert yelled as he instructedly pulled his weapon and fired at the mass on the floor. I froze in place as the worms disinterrogated from the bullet's impact, reforming hastily, crawling towards us. I tried to turn away and run, but it didn't react in time. To my surprise, the worms completely ignored my presence and headed straight for Robert, pouring onto him from all directions pulling him onto the ground. He screamed in agony. They formed around his limbs, making him unable to fight back. I hurried towards him and tried to pull them off. But for each worm I removed, a hundred others joined in. Within seconds, they managed to tear a hole in the armpit section of the suit. They immediately wriggled themselves through the hole. I tried desperately to pull him up. But he shoved me away and realized there wasn't any hope left for him. 
Get out of it, dog. He glared as blood started to fill his lungs. I didn't even hesitate. Shamefully, I ran for my life while the sanctuary was too distracted by consuming Robert. No matter what I had done, he was already dead. The hallways narrowed drastically as I once more returned to Section E and frantically tried to input the codes to close the airlocks. It took me two attempts with shaking fingers to get the correct code. Within seconds, the door sealed and I was once more separated from the abomination on the other side. I'm so sorry, Robert. I whispered to myself. The central dome finally gave in under pressure. Massive streams of water quickly collapsing the ceiling. The station fell apart and central power was annihilated under the flood. Plunging into darkness and silence, I ventured forward towards the docking station, while each section of Talos supposedly had their own backup generator. For some reason, it had been activated yet in that section, making it hard to navigate through the narrow labyrinths of hallways. Can anybody hear me? I called, my voice echoing endlessly. I bumped my head and saw a light appearing in the distance. James came running towards me, holding a flashlight. Doc, you're still with us. Thank God, he said. His joy quickly fleeting as he realized I had come alone. What happened? Where's Jen? And the captain? I just shook my head in response. No words could convey what had happened in the dome, and their absence proved enough. What an unfortunate outcome of futile escape attempts. No time to worry about that now. We need to get out of here. The capsule is just about ready to leave for the surface. We only need Henry to figure out how to get the power back. When we arrived at the docking station, I was relieved by the increase in the ceiling height. If only ever so slightly. Henry was busy at work with the control panel, trying to figure out what had cut the power from the backup generator. Abby standing behind him with a flashlight. God damn it, he yelled. Something has torn away the backup generator. Not sure how, but I'm sure I know what. Fucking abyssal demon spawn, he sighed. Between the lack of power and the damaged hull, the sub can release from the station. Essentially, we're stranded here. None of us spoke a word, trapped in a tin can 20,000 feet below the surface with no transport. After what felt like an eternity, Henry finally broke the silence. There are all great ideas, but that won't work, he said sarcastically in response to our lack of solutions. Well, do you have any idea, genius? Abby asked. Henry sighed. As a matter of fact, I do. He walked into the capsule and started messing around with the electronics, eventually pulling off one of the panels. There are three batteries powering up this sub. And the way I see it, I could take one of them out, and it should still have enough power to get you all to the surface. Us? Jamie asked. I need to connect this battery with the airlock. He continued as he pulled one of them out from the capsule. Then I'll override the door and blow up from pressure, and then resulting wave of water should forcefully eject the sub. What about you? Abby asked. Well, someone has to stay behind to follow through with this plan. Let me do it then, James interjected. No, you idiot. One wrong connection and the door fries, locking forever. I'm the only one with the expertise. There has to be another way. There isn't. Trust me. James and I looked at each other, both wanting to speak up, but neither able to come up with an alternate solution. Henry wanted to go into the transport capsule and sealed the panel shut again. I wish you were all smarter. 
Maybe one of you could have stayed behind, he said. As sarcastically as ever, but for the first time, with the slightest smirk on his face. Thank you, I said. Yeah, well, time for you to go, he said as he shut the door to the capsule. We watched as Henry walked away for the last time, ready to face his fate. An asshole to the bitter end, but one with a kind heart. Like the other perished crewmates, he would forever remain at the ocean basin, never again witnessing sunlight. Time went on forever while we waited for a wave of water that might just as likely crush us in an instant. But with a ton of luck, we'd be ejected out of the station and from what we could reach the surface, it would be most finely take off in the station history, but also the last. Minutes later, we heard a sound from the airlock opening before shattering to pieces under the immense pressure of exploding water in a sinkshore flash. It only took about 10 seconds for the wave to hit us, and we stood open from Talos. The whole way behind us falling apart as we did. It hit us hard and roughened us up a bit, but we survived. James took control of the vessel, and I didn't hesitate to start ascending towards the surface. Abby and I stared out of the tiny window. On the other side, we could see the utterly crushed remains of Talos, dimly illuminating by the light still powered up by the generators of Section C, which had been completely covered by the flash of the Sinkshim. The thousands of corpses of fish that previously littered the ocean floor had been cleaned up and were now part of an even growing monster from the abyss. A wave of relief washed over me, with a heart calming down for each foot of ascension. I no longer felt the need to constantly look out of the window. The world outside was dark, and whatever life once remained down there had been consumed alongside my longing for the ocean. Once we reached the depths of 5,000 feet, in the middle of the midnight zone, we managed to establish contact with the USS Orion and called for an emergency evacuation. They were quite the distance away, but by the time they reached the surface, they would pick us up. All but curious as what happened in the depths. At 3,000 feet, the first rays of sunlight greeted us with the warmth of the sun. The ocean started filling up with a piece of life. Fish thriving in waters completely ignorant to the horrors and existing directly below them. The vast darkness turning into calm blue. As for the first time since being hired for the mission, I felt safe. Before long, we breached the surface and we greeted the team, hearing hazmat suits as we boarded the ship. We had been unable to alert them to the situation. All they knew was that a potential contagion existed in the depths. One we could have been brought back with us, so understandably, they locked us up in a sick bay, isolated from the rest of the crew. For 72 hours, they pricked and prodded us, taking multiple blood samples and even a CSF probe. After they all returned normal, and no sign of sickness was apparent. They led us into more comfortable living arrangements, as we sat for sure. After being released from the sick bay, I hardly saw James and Abby. They spent most of the times in the room, only coming out for occasionally interrogation. Headquarters were incredibly curious as to how a state-of-the-art installation suddenly collapsed as we had absolutely no proof of the event that had transpired. They needed someone to blame, but as part of the CDC and not an original Talos crew who was safe from prosecution. All that was required from me 
was a sign of a non-disclosure agreement. One I'm breaking now into warning you about the horrors of the abyss. We know more about what exists in outer space than we do about life in our own oceans. And that's how it should remain forever. These creatures, the sink shrimp, can't be killed as long as one single cell remains. It would be enough to restart the hives. And I fear that with consumption of Talos, they have learned about life to the surface. Now that I'm posting this, I'm heading for the center of disease control. I can feel the worms wriggling inside my chest as I type this, ready to burst out at any moment. I guess the suit didn't protect me after all. I hope James and Abby are safe, that they get a second chance at living a happy life. I am so sorry for all of this, for what's to come. <laughs>